Hi, this is Dr. Otto Jenkins. Thank you for being with me today on A Cairo Rising. Today we have our second interview, and it's with Dr. Christopher Kent. Dr. Kent now is at Sherman College, but he's, he was in practice for many years. Uh, he taught at Palmer for years. Uh, I think he has such a unique viewpoint into chiropractic, the research of chiropractic, and more importantly, the communication of chiropractic. Uh, he spoke for about an hour with me. He has a PowerPoint that goes along with it, and feel free to just take your time with it. Go through it a couple times. It's, it's going to be right here. Uh, take take your time, and, and I think it's I think it's really special. Uh, again, it's with Dr. Christopher Kent, and this is a Cairo Rise. <music> interview in our process uh, with our Facebook page and with our website and this is a Cairo rising we have someone who I have the you know the very first time I saw you speak was in the mid 90s when you were working with the ICA for, uh, with uh, Dan Murphy's uh, whiplash speech. oh yeah his personal injury thing yeah that was great that was great I uh, love that I've been a fan of yours ever since uh, I've taken many of your courses. Uh, I love the online course you did with Advanced Subluxation. That was that was top notch stuff. And I'd highly recommend. And it's and, it's still available. Yeah, I highly recommend anybody. I matter of fact, everybody uh, who wants to know more about uh, about subluxation, uh, learn more about that. The research that goes along with that, the Advanced Subluxation training, fantastic stuff. Uh, the minimal amount of money you put in for it is uh, the, what you get from it is fantastic. I haven't introduced him yet, by the way. This is Doctor. This is Doctor Christopher Kent, by the way. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> by the way. Hey, you're at Sherman College now. How is Sherman College doing for you now? Oh, Sherman is great. Um, to me, there's there's simply no other place to be. I know it sounds kind of trite, but when you look at what the other colleges are doing, uh, and you're looking at what we're doing, I think. Uh, it's it's really profound. So I'm I'm pleased to be a part of the Sherman team. Even with our uh, our alma mater, you wouldn't have uh, say the same thing about our alma mater. Uh, I don't think we want to go there. I don't want to have to <laughs> a libel issue. The uh, other thing was, I tell you, uh, yeah. is it uh, is it Sherman who has the uh, seven seven year payoff of the loan? Uh, I'm not sure what the number is, but they do have a plan where, you know, you can pay off your student loans. Uh, we do include a program in practice management and uh, that teaches you, you know, how to run a successful practice in our model, which is, of course, subluxation correction uh, in a cash practice. I, I tell you, that's uh, we talk with students who come out of going into, into college and students who just graduated from college. But when they come out with that two hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar plus debt, overwhelming, and they have no plan of how to get rid of that or pay it off, and I, I think that Sherman has that, and that's that's phenomenal. That that alone. Uh, let's jump into your. Uh... Well, as you said, the interest is in how we can effectively communicate chiropractic, and how can we gain a greater understanding of it ourselves. And I came up with this concept one day called the Tick Triad. And it has three parts, and these are things that are becoming significant in the scientific literature. And they really resonate with what chiropractic's really all about. And the first is salutogenesis. And that's kind of an unusual sounding word. And it originated with the work of a medical sociologist named Anton Antonovsky. Do that again, <laughs> since we can edit. It originated with a medical sociologist named Aaron Antonovsky. And Antonovsky said that the traditional medical model separating health and illness isn't accurate, and that there's a health ease versus dis-ease continuum. Sure. And I think it's very significant that he hyphenated dis-ease and he talked about health ease, uh, just as chiropractic writers such as the Palmer said. Sure. And if we dissect that word salutogenesis, it comes from salut, 
And what do you say when you toast someone? Salud. 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 Why do soldiers salute each other? Uh, they're wishing health, invincibility, well-being, and happiness. And this term is defined by the World Health Organization as the process of enabling individuals and communities to increase control over and to improve their health. Wow. In other words, this is the same thing we're trying to do as chiropractors, right. and that is through the analysis and correction of vertebral subluxations, allow people to express their potential as human beings. And the idea is that we are looking for strategies that create health rather than diagnosing and treating disease. Uh, that may have a place, but it's not part of chiropractic. I got to tell you, I love that idea of increasing control over. That's that's phenomenal. That's just phenomenal. Yes. And I love what Antonovsky himself said. He said, we're coming to understand health not as the absence of disease, but rather the process by which individuals maintain their sense of coherence, that life is comprehensible, manageable, and meaningful, and that they have an ability to function in the face of changes within themselves, their relationships, and their environment. Wow. And it's that process of adaptability. It's that process of coherent interaction that is the essence of the human experience. Right. And if we go and, you know, he talks about health ease. So how do we go about defining health? Well, if we go way back to 1948, in 1948, the World Health Organization developed a definition I really like. They said health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So when you're communicating with patients and you're communicating with people outside the profession, if you can get them to understand that your goal is empowering people to live their potential, to become healthy, where health is realized to be a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, some pretty amazing stuff happens. Who doesn't want that? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, and secondly, it takes you out of competition with professions that are treating disease. That's the biggest part right there, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And kind of the, the guru of um, salutogenesis today is um, Craig Becker. And Craig Becker is a PhD nearby in North Carolina. And he wrote in one of his papers, the salutogenic model addresses the causes of global well-being rather than the origins of specific disease processes. It focuses on strategies, environments, and lifestyle choices that empower individuals to experience the full spectrum of the human experience. It's different than the medical model, which focuses on the causes of disease. And this is the part that I love. He said, theories about salutogenesis aim to explain why some people fall ill under stressful conditions and others do not. That's exactly the same question D.D. Palmer raised when he said, why do we have a situation where two men working at the same bench, at the same job, living in the same environment, eating the same food, find themselves in a situation where one is ill and the other enjoys health? Absolutely. And his conclusion was that it's something in them. It's not what's outside. And that something in them is their adaptive capacity, which can only be all that it can be if they're free from vertebral subluxation and nerve interference. Cool, 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 cool. So if we compare the two models, the pathologic model is the medical model focusing on prevention and early detection of disease. Not necessarily a bad idea because obviously if you're into treating disease, it's easier to treat it early on. But again, not chiropractic. The strategy is passive where the patient expects the doctor to do something for or to them. And the motive is fear. You know, why should you get your breasts irradiated, you know, so you don't die? Why should you get your blood pressure checked so you don't die? Why should you get your prostate poked so you don't die? You know, you don't hear ads saying, maximize your potential as a human being with colonoscopy. <laughs> it's all about fear and preventing something bad from happening. The practitioner's role is dominant 
Care is delivered in episodes related to specific conditions, and they're based on normal values and epidemiological data. So how does this differ from what we do as chiropractors? Yeah. Well, our goal is maximizing the expression of innate potential through a strategy that involves active empowerment. The chiropractor isn't a dominant maternalistic or paternalistic individual telling them what to do, but rather a partner, a coach in a lifetime process of realizing the goals that are set by the individual. Let me ask you a quick question of just about that, that chart right there. And do you find it, it's, it's hard for the public to change from someone who is fear-based to someone who is a, an ally in their health? And they, they actually expect us to be more fear-based at times? Well, unfortunately, some chiropractors have adopted that sure. as a means of promoting their practices. Sure. You know, they'll do a, a scan on a patient, a thermal or an EMG scan, and they'll say, oh, look at this. You have uh, an area of abnormality at uh, L3, and L3 innervates your genitalia and can also affect your back pain, which is why you came in. And if we don't fix this, uh, something can progress and it can get worse. And, oh, and look at this. This is the area that controls, you know, whatever it is. Sure. And, again, that puts them in the allopathic fear-based disease treatment model. If you say what we do here is very different, our focus is on creating health, not treating disease. Treating disease has a place, but that's not what we do here. We're concerned about making sure that your nervous system is working properly, that its function isn't being interfered with, and that you can use your maximum potential as a human being to interact with the world, whether you're sick or healthy. Whole different ball game. And if someone says, oh, I don't want that maximum potential. No, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be healthy. No, just, you know, get rid of my pain so I can continue to be miserable. You know, no, you know, that's not what we do. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about this sense of coherence, it sounds a little bit airy fairy to some people, but it's really very down to earth. Uh, comprehensibility means confidence that one's internal and external environment is structured, predictable, and explicable. In other words, you're not a victim. Um, we understand universal laws. We understand biological laws. And the world makes sense. It's something we can comprehend. The second, and this is a really big one, is manageability. Resources are available to meet the demands posed by internal and external stimuli. In other words, the difference between you and the chair you're sitting on now is the ability to adapt. Uh, if you throw the chair across the room, it doesn't have a heart that starts beating faster because it's moving faster. But if you start moving faster, your heart will increase its rate right. if it's working correctly. So um, manageability says we have the resources to meet changes in the internal and external environment. Right. And the third aspect of coherence is meaningfulness. These demands are challenges worthy of investment and engagement. In other words, as human beings, we want to expand our scope of experience, and we do that by maximizing our ability to adapt. So folks who've done research in this area, and this is this is take home research. This isn't, you know, what diseases will go away if I get my subluxations corrected. These are three common factors in people who enjoy health. And again, when you relate subluxation to these concepts, it becomes a whole new game. The first is control. The person's belief that they are able to influence the course of events. They're out of victim consciousness and they're into empowerment. Second, commitment. Embracing a curiosity and sense that life is meaningful, that we're here for a purpose. And when you identify that purpose, life becomes an act of joy. Right. Challenge. The individual's expectation that it's normal and beneficial for life to change. That you are going to be faced with challenges. And if you perceive those challenges as opportunities, you have the opportunity to grow and you have the opportunity to make your purpose as a human being uh, something real rather than theoretical. Awesome.
Awesome. Then we come up with a very cool term that um, was actually used in this article in the journal Human Physiology. So, you know, this is not coming from some chiropractic publication. It's a scholarly journal. And they came up with another interesting sounding term. And again, it's very elegant. Pre-nosology. Nosos means disease. So pre-nosological conditions are borderline states between health and disease, where you're not expressing your full potential as a human being, but you don't yet have a medically identifiable illness. And here's what they wrote about that. Depending on the functional reserves of the body, the vital force, different people exposed to the same stress develop different tensions of the regulatory system. So here we are in the journal Human Physiology, and they're talking about vital force. Right. And they're expressing the same idea that D.D. wrote about in 1910, exactly. 99 years later. <laughs> why different people exposed to the same stress develop different tensions in the regulatory system. And I emphasize the word tensions for a good reason, which you'll see in a second. Right. Prenosology, health should be regarded as an equilibrium between the body and the environment. The regulatory systems of the body should work intensely to make this so. And again, the degree of tension of the regulatory systems required to adapt the body to the environment may be regarded as a measure of health. So what did DD talk about in 1910? Tone. What's tone? Life is the expression of tone. Tone is the normal degree of nerve tension. So we're seeing people talking about health ease and dis-ease. We're seeing physiology journals talking about functional reserves and vital capacity yep. and tension and tone in biological systems. Amazing. I think that's exciting stuff. Amazing. And as he concluded here, the cause of disease is any variation in tone. Amazing. And that brings us to the second component of the tick triad, and that's adaptability. And adaptability is a key element in salutogenesis. Uh, as I've noted on, on several papers I've written, adaptability determines the scope of the human experience. Um, why do people jump out of perfectly good airplanes with parachutes to get a rush? Why do people go to movies that they think might make them cry? Why do people eat foods that burn on the way out as well as the way in? Because they're trying to experience more of what life has to offer. So as human beings, we have a choice. We can avoid challenges and narrow the scope of our experience, or, can, or we can remove barriers that limit that expression of our potential. It's adaptability that defines life. So if you look at the little picture of me here, if this is your scope of adaptability, and you're subjected to challenges or stressors that are this big, you got two options. You can say, I'm going to stop experiencing all that life has to offer, and I'm going to operate in this narrow frame of adaptability. Or you can say, hey, I want everything that life has to offer, and I'm going to look for strategies that will expand that scope of adaptability and get out of the way anything that's interfering with it. So are you saying then that we are the perfect uh, providers of that opportunity? Absolutely. The nervous system is the master and director of all bodily function. As my first chiropractor explained to me the first time I asked him what chiropractic was about, he said the nervous system is the master system of the body. It's life that heals. Cut the finger of a corpse, it doesn't heal. Cut your finger, it does. And third, he said when there's interference with the function of the nerve system, not only can it compromise your physical well-being, but it alters your perception of the world. It limits your ability to respond to the world. And when that happens to a significant number of people in a society, you have a sick society. And every dimension of the human experience, every action, every reaction, every motion, every emotion is processed through that nervous system. So, How old were you when you, uh, when you were first introduced to that? About 16. You know, I was uh, 
just entering college and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And um, my then best friend was encouraging me to see a chiropractor, had no idea what a chiropractor was. So I asked my mother who worked at uh, medical college and she said, that, oh, a chiropractor is someone who cracks your bones. And I said, cracks your bones? You mean they fracture? She said, I guess they must. You can hear them snap. So I had a serious contradiction here. My friend, who seemed reasonable and was certainly ambulatory, uh, was talking about how good it was. And my mother's talking about bones cracking. So I thought, how can I find out more without risking life and limb? So I told a chiropractor that I called that I was doing a report on chiropractic for school. <laughs> And that's when he, he told me the story, and that, that changed everything. Yes, it has. Yes. So in 1927, R.W. Stevenson, chiropractic textbook, the third sign of life. There are five signs of life. We don't have time to go into all of them, but the, the third is adaptability. And that's the ability that an organism possesses of responding to all forces which come to it. And um, if you can do that, you're in good shape. And by the way, you can't always do that. You know, if you're crossing the street when a train is coming along, you may not be able to adapt to the impact of that universal force rapidly enough to maintain a state of health. Correct. Uh, but in the vast majority of activities that we encounter, you can. And your ability to do so is in all probability far beyond what you think it is. Well, aren't you a perfect example of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I had a stroke. All four limbs were paralyzed. I was on a mechanical ventilator. A chiropractor came to see me in the hospital. He adjusted my atlas. Uh, shortly after that, I was able to wiggle the fingers on my right hand. Um, shortly after that, I was off the mechanical ventilator, and they literally carried me in on a gurney using uh, a bag mask system to assist my breathing, and I walked out with a cane. And... Uh, few years after that, I was taking aerobatic lessons in a jet. So when you look at what your potential is and how serious this concept of nerve interference can be, uh, it's really eye-opening. You know, I'd been a practicing chiropractor for a number of years when this event occurred, and I had seen things happen in my practice. But when it's you yeah. and you see going from a situation where your family was informed that you probably wouldn't make it through the week and they're coming to visit you for what they think is the last time to climbing into a jet and doing aerobatics, you know, that's quite a, quite a spectrum. And what do you think, uh, uh, and you're, you, I've heard you speak on this many times and you think it was a direct, direct correlation from that, uh, that upper cervical adjustment. Certainly. And I know that one can't determine causality solely because one event preceded the other, the so-called post hoc fallacy. But when you look at the totality of circumstances and you look at the fact that nothing had had any effect before then and that I continued to improve as I continued to get checked and adjusted as needed, um, I think that's pretty compelling evidence. Uh, put it this way, no one else got out of that hospital in 30 days that had the level of function I did. Wow. And uh, so you had a whole bunch of people who were pretty much coming on the goodbye tour for you. And yeah. In a short period of time, you're up and out of there uh, because of an adjustment. That has got to absolutely rock and change your, let's say, your, uh, your belief in what you do then. Well, again, it, it resulted in my, you know, becoming obsessed with doing what I can to preserve this uh, sacred trust, as, as BJ called it. Um, you know, that's how I got involved with the health committee at the UN and eventually was elected chair. That's why I decided to qualify as an attorney. That's why uh, I decided to, uh, instead of retire and watch the grass grow, uh, get back kind of to my roots as an educator by going to Sherman College. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So what else have we got going here? BJ talking about nerves being mediums of the transmission of innate mental impulses from the brain to all tissues of the body. The only abnormality possible is lack of function. And a mental impulse is a message sent to a tissue cell for the present instant. 
So Stevenson talked about how various physical mechanisms might be used to transmit that, like electricity, valency, magnetism, cohesion, and so forth. And what I really liked was he left the door open saying, perhaps some of these energies are not known to us in physics. What right have we to assume that we found them all? I remember in my philosophy class, someone asked the instructor, Dr. Price, what he thought about um, vitamins and food supplements. And he said, well, he said, I prefer to have my family eat a well-balanced diet so that they get nutrients that haven't been discovered yet, in addition to the ones that scientists have decided to put into a pill. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, and here we have BJ uh, working with uh, a device he developed called the electroencephaloneuromantipograph uh, in an effort to measure mental impulses. And it's interesting to see how the same quest is now reflected in science. It's recently emerged that individual adaptability depends on the interaction of adaptation mechanisms. And what are these? Your genetic legacy, epigenetics, how you express your genetic potential, more on that later, and what's going on in the environment. And the scientists in the journal Genes, Brain, and Behavior said the pathways to adaptability are the interactions between your genes, how you express your genes, your nervous system, and the environment. So we're seeing an explosion in science of open-minded individuals that are fascinated by what are truly core chiropractic philosophical positions and concepts and you know what we have that they don't? A way of making it real, a way of delivering it. Yep. So we need to understand how these mechanisms integrate those things. And if we look at the adaptability timeline here, the thing that happens real fast is the nerve response. Uh, then we have neuroplasticity. Uh, we know that the nervous system and particularly the brain can rewire itself as necessary uh, based on changes in what the body experiences and what the mind experiences. We know that our genes can be turned on or turned off depending on what environmental situation we have on. So we've got this which happens real quick. We have this which takes a little longer. We have this which can last several generations. And um, if you want to look at this guy, uh, He's, he's, he's a little while from having an iPad in his hand. Um, that takes a real long time. A long time. So, real long time. So that's kind of how it works. So can we measure adaptability? Yes. Uh, one technology we can use uh, that has been explored in chiropractic is heart rate variability. And I got into an argument once with a chiropractic skeptic who taught basic sciences at one of the colleges. And he said, you know, you guys say that, yeah, why was that happening? Uh, I don't know. I guess because I had nothing to do with hiring at that institution. But anyway, um, he said, you guys have it wrong about the nervous system being the master system of the body. He said, I can take a heart out of an animal, even out of a human being. And if it has adequate nutrition and oxygen, it'll beat outside the body for a long time without any connection to the nervous system at all. And I said, well, let's continue this thought experiment. Let's say that the person you removed that heart from, uh, for whatever reason, tried to start running. Would the heart in the jar beat faster without a connection to the nervous system? And that got him thinking. So what we're doing when we're looking at heart rate variability is we're looking at how well the body's responding to environmental demand. And uh, I won't get into this, but... Uh, we looked at uh, almost 2,000 scans of patients under chiropractic care, and we found that on admission to care, most of them were in a defensive fight flight start, you know, that, that primitive reflex. You know, someone cuts you off on the highway, and pretty soon uh, the jaw tightens, and, uh, you know, the skin changes color, and the muscles tighten, and there's this this burst of energy and possibly even rage and there's no way to express it. So it's internalized and it does destructive things to the body. And we found that 
the balance between the two parts of the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that works automatically, that regulates your organs, glands, and blood vessels, that they become more balanced and the person's level of adaptive potential increases uh, under chiropractic care. Pretty cool. So when you first did this scan, uh, 1948 scans, I mean, I'm fine. I, I do scans on everybody who walks in my door. I do, I do scans on them uh, numbers of times during the year. I have found in my practice over the last couple of years, the number of people coming in who are in sympathetic overdrive is in the 90, probably 97 and 98 percent of people maybe 90, 90, yep. walk in my door and some are in that two, yep. three uh degrees away who are just they've got their their hammer on the on the gas pedal and it exactly it's scary it's, scary. it's, scary. it's very scary it's scary. and it's very dangerous and um if you look at the health crisis we have today and i don't want to go down that bunny hole because that's kind of a lecture in itself but for the first time since the 1960s, uh, you know, uh, the death rate hasn't gone down, despite the fact that we are spending more than twice as much money on disease treatment as the next developed country on the list. So that would corroborate what you found clinically, of course. So what decreases heart rate variability? It indicates decreased adaptability, increased mortality risk, because if you can't adapt, you're more likely to die. In fact, that's kind of how this got started. Cardiologists wanted to find a way to predict people who were at risk for sudden death. People with decreased HRV have an increased risk for arrhythmic events, and depressed people have decreased HRV. Obesity causes a decrease of HRV. And these people become overreactive. And as we all know, obesity is associated with all kinds of um, illness. We know that older persons also, also have a blunted autonomic response. It's not as, as rapid and robust as it should be. And if you do nothing, aging is associated with a decline in cardiac autonomic control but they found that older people who exercise are able to counteract these effects. So again, the choices that you make have a tremendous amount to do with how you respond to the world. Next, cognition is affected by heart rate variability. Um, several studies on that. Uh, and this is one that absolutely blew my mind came out just a couple of years ago in the Clinical Journal of Neurophysiology. And, you know, the Clinical Journal of Neurophysiology, that's, that's a pretty high-level publication. Uh, this is not some airy-fairy alternative medicine thing. And they, they write, previous studies have shown that autonomic dysfunction, in other words, inability to adapt, is associated with shorter survival in patients with advanced cancer. We examined the association between heart rate variability, a measure of autonomic function, and the survival in a large group of patients with cancer, and the presence of cancer in combination with decreased HRV was associated with shorter survival time. So regardless of whether it's diabetes, obesity, psycho-emotional problems, cognitive processing, or even cancer, when your scope of adaptability is compromised, there's a price to pay. Absolutely, you know, I uh, I have a paper coming out um, in a short time on, we, we started to see women in our practice who are post breast cancer, uh, their HRV is, is, it's almost not even on the chart anymore. And uh, most, their, prog their prognosis is for, card is for cardiovascular disease and or breast cancer. It's like, you yeah. just had breast cancer and your set of is up uh, because their inability to adapt, their chances for cardiovascular disease is just astronomical. Just, uh, yeah, so you look at, uh, you know, these papers and you say, well, if they know all this, why aren't they doing yes. anything about it? Yes. And they're trying. Some are saying, well, maybe we can develop medications that will fix this. And others are saying, well, let's uh, implant vagal nerve stimulators in an effort to to balance it, and none of them are saying, hey, you know, 
Um, why, you know, uh, why don't we have internal vagal nerve stimulators? Well, we do. <laughs> uh, the idea is to see to it that there's no interference so that the system can, can respond appropriately. Yep. Yep. So what kind of stuff improves HRV? Uh, tai Chi, yoga, meditation, basically anything that's good for you. Yep. And also correcting problems in the spine. In fact, a group of osteopaths looked at healthy subjects, people that had no symptoms, people that had no underlying musculoskeletal disorder, and they found that if they corrected the upper cervical spine, that area where the brain stem meets the spinal cord, favorable changes occurred in heart rate variability. You didn't have to be sick to benefit from this. And in chiropractic, Dr. John Zong, who used to be director of research here at Sherman, looked at 96 chiropractic practices and 625 patients in there and did a single pre-post study. He was able to follow 132 of those patients for four weeks. And his conclusion was that chiropractic care was associated with a shift to a healthy nervous system balance. And that takes us to the third item, which is epigenetics. And if we look at epigenetics, we have to think of Bruce Lipton. And Bruce Lipton is a person who used to teach um, at several medical schools, including the University of Wisconsin, pretty prestigious place. And I had the opportunity to interview him for our uh, subscription service on purpose. And one of the lines that he dropped was just so profound. Like I tell people, it hit me like a, a cattle prod in the gonads. And I had to stop and say, Bruce, give me some time to process this one, that a cell cannot be in growth and defense at the same time. Uh, he said, that's a basic tenet of cell physiology. And I said, well, Bruce, if that's true, that would mean that a person can't be in growth and defense at the same time. A family can't be in growth and defense at the same time. A city can't be in growth and defense at the same time. A country can't, and certainly a profession can't. And that's something I found very inspiring. I said, well, we have to get out of defense and into growth. Absolutely. So here we have Watson and Crick, who described the double helical structure of DNA and for a long time, and I'm sure that's the case when you went to school and when most of our listeners went to school, uh, what were you taught? Well, that is what determines your potential as a human being. Yes. You got half from your mother. You got half from your father. Um, that's all you're going to be. There's nothing you can do about it. That's well, that's pretty depressing, in my opinion. But what we're seeing now is that there's a lot that you can do about it. Uh, this is from the cover of Time, Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny. And if we look at these two mice, they have the same genetic composition, but the expression of that genetic legacy is completely different. And the reason is not the lifestyle choices that were imposed on them by investigators, but that of previous generations. And we've seen in human studies of, of Holocaust survivors, of people that uh, were subjected to severe famines during natural disasters, that the changes in metabolism that they had developed in response to that were showing up in future generations. So the decisions that you make and the actions that you take today not only affect you, but future generations too. And by the way, these aren't permanent changes. Uh, and an analogy that someone used was, it's kind of like if you lay in the sand and you get up and your, your impression is left there in the sand, how long will it be there? Well, it depends on the wind and the tide and everything else. It won't be forever, but it will last longer than the time you, you were laying there. So that's kind of the way epigenetics happens. So, so, so epigenetics can happen to you, but then you can, can you epigenetic the epigenetics out? Well, what can happen is okay. that um, when you start making better lifestyle choices, the epigenetic changes will be favorable. In fact, um, you know, one one person was talking about how, you know, when you live with a healthy person, you're more likely to become healthier yourself. And there, there may be more to it 
than uh, just having someone to inspire you. It may be that making those changes in your life um, is creating a, a better epigenetic pattern. Absolutely. So uh, another thing we know is that as we age, DNA is damaged. And this was a study that I was involved in where we looked at serum thiol levels which are a surrogate indicator of DNA repair enzymes. And we found that people under long-term care had higher serum thiol levels, which is desirable, than people with chronic illness and even higher than uh, age and gender matched controls. And we had our 15 minutes of fame in medical news today where they wrote, there's a growing body of evidence that wellness care provided by doctors of chiropractic may reduce healthcare costs improve health behaviors and enhance patient perceived quality of life. Until recently, however, little was known about how chiropractic adjustments affected the chemistry of biological processes on a cellular level. In a landmark study published this week in the Journal of Vertebral Subluxation Research, chiropractors collaborating with researchers at the University of Lund found that chiropractic care could influence basic physiological processes affecting oxidative stress and DNA repair. Uh, we were hoping to get funding for a larger study based on this, but it never happened. So um, think about it. You, uh, you might want to help contribute to chiropractic research. I say that as president of the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation Research. <laughs> and if we look at stress and epigenetics and kind of try and tie this whole thing together, people say, you know, if only I could live a stress-free life. Well, that's not going to happen until you assume room temperature and go on to whatever your reward might be. Because as long as you're alive, stress will cause you to adapt and you'll want that to happen. So when Hans Selye, who came up with the notion of stress as applied to biological systems, something he borrowed from, from the engineering world, he said there are two kinds. There's eustress or positive stress. And in this journal article, they said positive stress is an effector, in other words, for gene expression. In other words, part of this epigenetic stuff is determined by being exposed to positive stress. And it's recognized that the environment and our perception or interpretation of it directly controls the activity of our genes. And that while most genomic studies focus on finding the cause of disease, scientists and physicians are now looking for what keeps people healthy. Wow, that's exciting stuff. So there's old Hans, MD, PhD, and he defined stress as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand and said every living being has a certain innate amount of adaptation energy or vitality. Yes, this renowned MD PhD is talking about innate energy and vitality. And Selye said, you don't want a stress-free life because complete absence of stress is incompatible with life and only dead people make no demand. And that the secret of health and happiness lies in successful adjustment to the ever-changing conditions on this globe. And the penalties for failure in this process of adaptation are disease and unhappiness. So instead of this fight-flight response being triggered, Selye said, how the body perceives an event, whether it is seen as a challenge and opportunity or a threat, determines what kind of physiology you're going to have, how you're going to respond to it. And if you respond to it as a threat and you go into freeze, fight, flight, like most of the patients that you've scanned, a lot of destructive stuff is happening. But if you look upon it as an opportunity, if you change your perception of what's going on, how your body responds is going to change dramatically and you're going to have a growth experience, a positive experience, epigenetic experience, and you're going to expand that all important scope of adaptability. And to the best of our knowledge, only human beings can transmute distress into eustress by using the rational mind. And the tool that you need for that is a nervous system 
that's free from interference. And that's what chiropractic care is all about. So we've gone into more depth than you need when you're communicating with a patient. I'll tell you how simple it is. When I was at the UN, um, you know, a lot of medical doctors were involved. And sometimes they'd say, oh, you're a chiropractor. You deal with back and neck pain. And I said, no. I said, uh, there are some chiropractors who choose to specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of back and neck pain. But that's really not chiropractic. That's more physical medicine. Uh, what we as chiropractors do is we focus on adaptability, quality of life, and spinal correction. And he said, oh, okay. I mean, no one said quack, go home. That's a nutty idea. They understood the difference. That's amazing because you and I both know there's people in our own profession who don't. That yeah, and there are people in our profession who say that, you know, you can't get published in medical journals if you use that term. You know, I know people who have, including myself. Uh, there are people who say, uh, you know, if we don't use medical terminology, we can't uh, participate in uh, these various programs and so forth. And I said, you know, as your mother once probably told you, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. So be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Be a chiropractor. Uh, understand what it is and, and deliver it because who doesn't want the ultimate expression of their potential as a human being? And, and don't you firmly believe that this is exactly, that that terminology, that that language is exactly what America, that humans, that the world needs, especially now? Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the bad news is there aren't enough of us to provide it. So um, do your job, you know, uh, get out there, serve as many people as you can while maintaining a, a reasonable level of quality and skill and give people the empowerment that they deserve as human beings. Yeah. Give them, give them that. Uh, and we actually change, uh, we'll change generations uh, get ahead of us too. Absolutely. That's the exciting thing about this. Love that. Absolutely love that. Love that. Yeah. Cool. Dr. Kent, I know you're uh, you're speaking at uh, Barcelona this weekend, although you will not be speaking at Barcelona this week. Well, I'm speaking to the folks in Barcelona. We weren't able to find satisfactory trial arrangements. Uh, tra <laughs> <laughs> Their lawyer comes out again. Uh, travel arrangements. Yeah, no one's on trial yet. Uh, but... Uh, as a result, I had suggested that we do it online, and they said, well, I'll take it to the committee and see if they'll go for it. And they said, yeah, we'll go for it. So uh, that's going to be using a different platform, Zoom. So uh, my task between now and then is to learn how to do Zoom so I can do better than PowerPoint, where I can, in fact, switch between the various images I see on the screen without getting kicked out. Easy stuff. Easy stuff. Yeah. So... Uh, last thing for you, I've put you on the screen. Sure. Is, for you. Last, uh, is how did your communication change from back then to now? now? It seems like it's got even simpler and easier. Oh, absolutely. Last, and, um, you know, you, you, you tend to overthink it if you're a, kind of a research and literature oriented person as I am. And you have to realize that when you're communicating with the public, you know, they, they just don't have that background. And, and the cool thing is when you have this understanding, it helps to keep you grounded when you do get into the scientific world and you start to see, see the literature. You know, how many people that read those papers that I shared excerpts from with you would see it through the lens of a chiropractor? Very few. How many of them would use it to develop strategies for patient communication, you know, fewer yet. So when you realize how, how simple chiropractic is in its elegance, um, you know, BJ used to talk about getting sick people well, as did DD, and that has since evolved from getting sick people well to allowing individuals to express their life potential, regardless of what illnesses they may or may not have. You don't have to be sick to benefit from chiropractic care. And the fact that you're getting chiropractic care doesn't necessarily mean your diseases will go away. What it does mean is that a life without nerve interference is a life with greater potential. So regardless of what health challenges you may be facing 
and indeed many of them will resolve after you get your subluxations corrected. Um, regardless of whether that happens or not, you're going to be in a better place in terms of your ability to enjoy life and to experience what it has to offer. Absolutely love that in 18 different ways. Uh, I truly appreciate you for that your time with us today, uh, your expertise, your love of your time with chiropractic, uh, the way so, so, so I think simply and elegantly uh, uh, teach the uh, how, how the communication of chiropractic, how the end chiropractic is, is just uh, it is it's phenomenal and able to use it from a, just, a, a, a such a different viewpoint than a different way and, and we're being happy and hammered with on a regular basis. Uh, so, uh, as I have discussed many times, this is, this is exactly what America needs, exactly, exactly what the world needs, what humans need. It's what the world needs, it's what the world needs, and adjusting us, like say, and adjust. Absolutely. So, thank you for the opportunity. It's always fun. I appreciate it. Get dressed up. Yeah, you, you had, had a few false starts there, but you can make it pretty. Dr. Christopher Kelly. And uh, once again, you are the uh, head of the uh, of you're at you're, you're at the first floor. You're, you're, you're at Sherman right now. Uh, what's your Sherman right now? Your uh, title there. Sherman right now. I'm director right now. of evidence informed curriculum and practice, right and I'm also a professor. Right I teach a couple courses. Cool stuff. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Cool. Stuff. Truly appreciate time. Appreciate truly your love of chiropractic, and uh, any way we can be of service to you, please let us know. Okay. Thank you, Otto. Thank you much, Dr. Christopher Kent. Dr. Thank